Hello and welcome to the African world. I'm Kwame Clement reporting. And I'm Wilma Red. On the program today, we present a documentary entitled Empowering the African Woman, commissioned by the African Ambassadors Group in Washington, D.C. to celebrate Africa Day 2015. Also on today's program, we go back to the founding of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, now the African Union, the AU, with a documentary presented for Africa Day 2013 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the OAU, AU. Forward then to independence. Finally, we will share with you a message from Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for it's African fitting Affairs. That this Africa Day is celebrating the AU's theme of women's empowerment and development toward Africa Agenda 2063. But we begin with our documentary, Empowering the African Woman. When African leaders gathered for the annual summit in 2014, they issued a bold vision for the continent in what they called Agenda 2063. We are presenting Agenda 2063 for adoption by the summit. The agenda lays out a set of goals and plans the continent hopes to achieve by the year 2063 the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Organization of African Unity, now the African Union. It's a robust framework for all the African nations to come together, to work together to build a prosperous and united Africa based upon our shared values. Critical to achieving the overarching goals of Agenda 2063 is the development and empowerment of Africa's human resources particularly its women. Ultimately, Africa's prosperity depends on Africa's greatest resource, its people. I think there's an increasing recognition that if countries are going to reach their full economic potential, then they have to invest in women. The Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action gave the world a powerful statement of principle. Women's rights are human rights. This is not just human rights, but also common sense. Thank you for recognizing the importance of placing women and girls at the center of the continent's social and economic development. Women's rights is a human rights issue. I think that Africa cannot prosper if women do not prosper. Empowerment of women is about focusing our attention on those interventions in society in terms of resources, in terms of policies, so that women can play their rightful role in contributing to the development of their communities, of their societies, of their countries. Empower women. Empower humanity. Let's picture it. Africa today boasts many successful women. I stand before you today as the first woman elected to lead an African nation. It's a great privilege for me to work for the United Nations and to serve under Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Komboha is like many other small Egyptian towns, except the mayor is a woman. Yves Habil was appointed by the central government, but is following in the footsteps of her father and her grandfather. I would like to say, Grandpa, I am a woman and I am mayor of this village. I went to the parliament through the national list, which is the quota for women. I like to brag sometimes and say that we have more women in parliament than most of developed countries, including the United States. As much as they are accomplished, they know from personal experience the difficulties of life for the typical African woman. I grew up in a village in Nigeria. I know what it meant to go to the stream to fetch water, what it means to go to the farm with my grandmother to farm agricultural products, what it means when people are poor and they cannot uh, get enough to eat. When I was a small girl in the countryside, swimming, 
and fishing with twine made from palm trees. No one would have picked me out as the future president of our country. So my feet are in two worlds. The world of poor rural women with no respite from hardship and the world of accomplished Liberian professionals. They are therefore the first to admit that there are profound structural impediments to the African woman fulfilling her full potential, impediments reflected in the early deaths of many African women. What breaks my heart is the fact that when you, if we see women that are dying, most of them are between 15 and 19. It is for precisely these reasons that the African Union declared 2015 the year of the empowerment of African women. 2015 is the African year of empowerment of women with the intention to make progress in a number of challenges facing women. The African Women Empowerment rests on a simple premise. As primary caregivers, particularly for young children, Women are pivotal and key players in society. In uh, many parts of the world, where you have a woman in a bad position, the child is bound to be there. The African Women Initiative thus reflects the realization that when we help one woman, we help scores and scores of people. Given the division of labor that uh, exists in many societies, where you have a woman empowered, then you have the opportunity of also empowering communities. True empowerment of African women requires providing them access to education. My wish is to finish college. This is the dream of the African girl. We have to work with girls at a young age and get them to understand the relationship between the math that they're learning in first and second grade and the potential careers that that could lead to as they develop into young women. At least at the primary level, you needed to establish some kind of quota to bring the women on the competing table. Clearly, education is tied to economic prosperity. Keeping a girl in school four more years is not about, just about her future, it's about her health. Empowerment of African women also requires providing them access to adequate health care. There has been a decline in child mortality and maternal mortality because of good policies. Between the 2000 and 2010, for instance, it has dropped in sub-Saharan Africa alone by 41 percent. That's a major advancement. But we still have a long way to go. Some of the challenges are early marriage, uh, which then leads to early pregnancy, which also contributes to the maternal death rate. Because if you are having babies too young, your body's not ready for it, you can wind up dying in, in labor or during pregnancy. One key way to help women fight poverty and ensure they have equal access to opportunity as men is to help them in the areas of agriculture, particularly so that women are already the main players in farming in Africa. In the next 10 years, no woman should be using a hoe so that after 10 years we can indeed put it in the museum. And I take seriously her charge to mechanize African agriculture so that African women can, as she said, retire to the museum, the handheld hoe. As Africa is embarking on modern agriculture, the women have to be empowered at the, the beginning of that kind of process. We all know that in many African countries, women are the hub of agriculture. Women are the hub of a lot of the economy. Empowering women in the agricultural sector is part of a broader plan to give women a leg up economically. And when we talk about our economy of subsistence, it relies on women. They tend to their families, they, they feed uh, the extended families, mm -hmm. but they stay within those kind of traditional ways of producing that are not sustainable unless we give them a boost, credit. To promote women's economic empowerment, the African Union, the African Development Bank, the World Bank Group, African countries and the United States all have supported efforts to increase women's access to markets, to capital, and to assets. So we want to move women from being employees to being employers. In addition 
to the economic empowerment of women, the full emancipation and empowerment of the African woman requires that she be a full participant in national policy decision-making and at the very highest levels. Accordingly, there is a major push across Africa to give all women access to political power. AU has driven the 30 percent quota of women representation, but at this point we still have just 10 countries that are at that particular level. But there is an increasing recognition that setting aside parliamentary seats for women is not enough. It's not enough to pass a local law requiring one-third of local election candidates to be women. Women need training in how to be candidates. Our embassy in Mauritius offered to train women to be effective at campaigning so that they could compete and win elections. Following the training, the number of elected women quadrupled. The small gains women have made politically have already begun to change perceptions in certain countries about the traditional roles of women and men. My Minister of Gender and Development likes to tell the story of a kindergarten child who was recently asked what he wanted to be when he grew up. And she urged him to aim for the highest that he could think of. He responded, I want to be the vice president. <laughs> Puzzled, the teacher asked him, why did you just say vice president? Because being a president is a woman's job. <laughs> At the very least, this young man will grow up in a society where it is considered normal for a female to be president. Despite the gains, it is clear that fully empowering the African woman economically and politically would require far-reaching legal reforms to knock down the cultural, traditional, and the structural institutional barriers that have held back women's progress across the continent, literally, for centuries. The question of empowering women um, also touches a um, legal framework uh, that uh, their rights uh, have to be grounded in, in laws and constitutions. Legally increasing women's land rights. I've got keys for my house, free at last. I'm happy. <laughs> Urging land registration in both a husband and wife's name. Legal reforms in many countries are also critical to tackling the issue of violence against women. If one is to address violence, we have to look at the legal and uh, institutional mechanisms that are in place. Focus on women and girls who have been involved in conflict and who have been the victims of gender-based violence. It is a fact that we're still dealing with the issue of violence against women. This is a reminder of how far we still have to go in the fight to empower women and ensure equality for all. However, there is an increasing awareness that with a proper emphasis on empowerment, women can look confidently to a future of full equality. I see Africa with full gender equality. I see Africa where women have economic opportunities, political empowerment, and social inclusion. I see the empowered African women uh, showing women around the world how to lead. The women of Africa! The future belongs to us because we have taken charge of it. Yeah. Kwame Clement will be back in just a moment. Forward then to independence. To independence now. Tomorrow, the United States of Africa. April 15, 1958. 
was a typically hot and humid day in Accra, the capital of newly independent Ghana, as African leaders began streaming in for the first conference of the independent states of Africa that would lay the foundation for African unity. The eyes of the world and all Africa are focused upon us and our deliberations at this time. Only eight African countries were independent at the time. Ghana, Liberia, Libya, Morocco, Egypt, Sudan, Tunisia, and Ethiopia. Thanks to their efforts, in a few short years, the ranks of independent African states would grow as much of French colonial Africa became free and independent. Independence would project on the world's stage a new core of African leaders that embodied the confidence of an independent continent. Our guest of honor today, the president of Tanganyika, has played a role uh, comparable to those uh, distinguished Americans in the founding of his country. And every time I think of the United States, I think also of the freedom of my people. As more African countries gained their independence, there was a growing push for continental unity. But soon there were fissures. On the one hand, there was the Casablanca group, led by Nkrumah of Ghana, Mudibo Keita of Mali, Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria, Gamer Abdel Nasser of Egypt, Sekuture of Guinea. De africaine a tenu une session spéciale. They wanted immediate and total political unity in Africa. On the other hand, there was the Monrovia group, led by William Topman of Liberia, Namdi Azikwe of Nigeria, Félix Houfoué Bonnier of La Côte d'Ivoire, Léopold Seda Singer of Senegal, la negritude... among others, who opted for a more gradual approach to unity. The differences between the two groups threatened to torpedo all hopes of fostering unity on the continent. Deft diplomacy by Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie would save the day. He invited the leaders of all 32 independent African states to Addis Ababa to hash out their differences. After several days of meeting, they will hammer out a charter giving birth to the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, on May 25, 1963, the largest regional organization the world has ever known. The OAU was not the total political union that Nkrumah and others had hoped for, but it was a good beginning, and the organization focused attention on what all in Africa agreed on, the total independence of the continent. Thanks to the work of the OAU, in a few years, much of the remaining 20 or so states in Africa, still under colonial rule, would become free. By the end of the 1970s, also as a result of the work of the OAU and the struggle of freedom fighters like Amical Cabral, an état se développe chez nous. Agostino Neto and Samora Machel. La lutte continue. Mozambique, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, and Angola would also be free. The African Convention is gonna take place in now, the OAU could focus its efforts on the last bastion of resistance to true independence in Africa the racist apartheid regime in South Africa. The organization had, in fact, for long given support to the struggle to free South Africa from white minority rule. A fake passport given to Nelson Mandela by the Ethiopian government under the assumed name of David Morsi Mai is typical of the support, small and large, that the OAU and its member states had given the freedom fighters in South Africa. Soon, however, as a result of the Rivonia trial, Mandela, Walter Sisulu, 
Governor Becky, and the entire leadership of the ANC would be in jail on Robin Island. Only Oliver Tambo of the ANC's leadership would be free by in exile. This letter he wrote to the OAU as it met for its second summit in Cairo in July 1964 speaks to the support the OAU had given the South African struggle. In a poignant line from the letter, Tambo noted that the second day of the conference, July 18, would be Mandela's 46th birthday, and he hoped the organization will on that day take a decisive action that will strike a blow to our pithy. It would take another two decades of struggle, but triumph would finally come in 1990 when Mandela was released. With his release and election in 1994 as president of South Africa, the OAU had finally achieved its goal of totally liberating the country. And what a joyous occasion it was when he joined the summit meeting of the OAU shortly after his release held in the very city where it was founded, Addis Ababa. It was also fitting, too, that it would be in South Africa that the OAU, having achieved its goal of freeing Africa, will transition to the African Union, the AU. With the second generation of African leaders now taking charge on the continent, the AU is focused on regional economic cooperation and integration as a tool for fostering political unity. Africa being now free and united, we must think now about the development of Africa by the Africans. That was the vision of the founding fathers. So whatever we may say, the OAU, together with the AU, has given us 50 years of great achievements. And it is proper, therefore, that we pause to pay tribute to those early leaders, 32 of them, who laid the foundation for the Africa we know today when they signed the charter of the OAU 50 years ago. Thanks to them and their work, each of us can proudly say, I am an African. I owe my being to the hills and the valleys, the mountains and the glades, the rivers, the deserts, the trees, the flowers, the seas, and the ever-changing seasons that define the face of our native land. I know that none dare challenge me when I say I am an African. Today, it feels good to be an African. As we celebrate 50 years of African unity and the dawn of a new age of optimism on the continent, each of us can proudly say, today it feels good to be an African. Long live African unity. To mark Africa Day 2015, we're pleased to have the United States Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, present a special statement on behalf of the United States State Department. Ambassador Greenfield. Greetings, African colleagues and friends. I want to thank the Africa Ambassadors Group for hosting this Africa Day celebration. And I want to extend a special thanks to this year's co-chairs, Ambassador Bilal of Morocco and Ambassador Tafik of Egypt. It is fitting that this Africa Day is celebrating the AU's theme of women's empowerment and development toward Africa Agenda 2063. I wanna thank you for recognizing the importance of placing women and girls at the center of the continent's social and economic development. Long-term prosperity will only be possible 
when women and men enjoy equal opportunities. You as Assistant Secretary of State, Linda Thomas Greenfield, shared several examples of the U.S. government's programs to empower women in Africa. It's not enough to pass a local law requiring one-third of local election candidates to be women. Women need training in how to be candidates. Our embassy in Mauritius offered to train women to be effective at campaigning so that they could compete and win elections. The government of Mauritius collaborated with us and advertised the campaign training in newspapers throughout the country. Following the training, the number of elected women quadrupled. This is a powerful example of democracy and women's empowerment in Mauritius. Here is another example from Namibia. The ruling party in Namibia met its own self-imposed quota for gender parity by alternating women and men on the electoral roll for the 2014 elections. As a result, women won 41% of the parliamentary seats. The government then organized a week-long workshop for all female parliamentarians, a program the Deputy Prime Minister helped moderate. The Assistant Secretary of State speaks of work being done in Equatorial Guinea to promote women's rights. Last year, our embassy in Malabo held a roundtable on the prevention and elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls as part of the 16 Days Against Gender Violence in Equatorial Guinea campaign. The U.S. is also working for women empowerment across West Africa in practical ways. New programs in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Libya, Mali, Rwanda, Somalia, and Uganda, as well as across West Africa, are focusing on advancing women's land rights and mitigating election-related violence. Economic empowerment of women is another key area. To promote women's economic empowerment, the African Union, the African Development Bank, the World Bank Group, African countries, and the United States all have supported efforts to increase women's access to markets, capital, and assets. As President Obama said in June 2013 in Cape Town, South Africa, and I quote, we support societies that empower women because no country will reach its potential unless it draws on the talents of our wives and our mothers and our sisters and our daughters. You can measure how well a country does by how it treats its women." Unquote. She called on all Africans to redouble their efforts. We still have a long way to go to make this a real African women's decade. So I ask you, let's redouble our efforts to make this our priority. Thank you. What has it been, Kwame Clement? And I'm Wilma Red for the African World. We'll see you next time on another edition of the program. So long.